A fast-paced intro to established tone! The bonk of the stranger opens on your boy Dolorous Ed picking up Longclaw, but that seems boring. So we're just gonna skip ahead to where something interesting happens. Oh. Oh, jeez. Well, Masande's pants are kinda interesting, so let's start there. In Marine, Tyrion is met with resistance from Wormo and Masand Bay about meeting with the slavers. Masande points out the difference between knowing and understanding slavery, which I think is pretty good, if not a bit stilted. You drink and you know things, but you do not understand them. As a clever man once told me, we make peace with our enemies, not our friends. It's strange to hear Tyrion referring to middle fimbers with such respect, and stranger still to hear him quote something he wasn't there for. We only make peace with our enemies, my lord. That's why it's called making peace. I'm then forced to imagine an interaction between Tyrion and Baelish where Peter said this and I just can't do it. The only times they were both in King's Landing were in early season 2 and early season 3 and the only attempts at peace in either of those times were between Stannis and Renly. If you stretch the concept, you could maybe count the Lannises and the Tyrells, but Tyrion had nothing to do with that. I know it's just a fun little callback the writers wanted to throw in, but I'm in charge here and I say that you can't have fun unless it's internally consistent. Yep, that's right. All about internal consistency here on the We Grab. Our queen tried to make peace with the masters and they tried to murder her. Did she? Uh? After conquering their cities and giving only lip service to their governance thereafter, Daenerys' only peacemaking efforts in season 5 were domestic, marrying Hisdar and reopening the fighting pits to placate the sons of the harpy. Previously, Dario and Hisdar were in negotiations with Yunkai, but Danny refused their terms, only starting to compromise after Barristan was killed. Yunkai isn't even mentioned between Dario's return to Marine and Danny's departure from Marine. So that's fucking dumb. Missandei also attributes the actions of the Harpies to these masters, which like, I know Varys said that they're behind the Harpies last episode, but first of all, that's so fucking boring. And second of most, why does Missandei trust Varys, whose intel came from a single woman? Why, it almost seems as though there's something more complicated going on with the sons of the harpy. Our next scene is the next scene. The slavers want Danny's crew to naff out of their bay, gulf, large body of water. Which is funny because the sons of the harpy, who they fund, destroyed the means by which they could do that. Yezin speaks for Astapor, which Tyrion points out as lucky and I point out as lazy. Tyrion points out that you don't need slaves to exploit the lower classes and everybody in their room, with their worldview centred entirely around slavery, neglects to point out that Tyrion's feudalism seems to produce similar end products to slavery. There haven't been slaves in Westeros for hundreds of years and I grew up richer than any of you. Like, nobody points out how perverse this is. We know that at the time of Daenerys' conquest, there were three slaves for every master in Marine. Do you think that Westeros has a similar ratio of nobles to peasants? Yes. I'm not even making any social commentary. Just saying that there are so many opportunities for this story to say something interesting, and it flatly refuses to do so at every juncture. This conflict in Slaver's Bay is just begging to have its complex causes examined, but instead of saying something about culture and rulership and economics and the way those things relate and the way they change or resist change, season 6 reduces all of this to a unidimensional good versus bad story. Now, slavery is bad, it turns out, and not slavery is good, but there's so much more going on here that is just compressed into nothingness. The domestic unrest, the resistance to Danny's foreign occupation, it, yeah, it was just funded by these bad guys. Season 6 presents a situation roughly analogous to contemporary real-world issues, and the solution it proposes is, have your dragon explode the bad guys. I'm not here to change the way of the world. Slavery is the way of our world. You don't need slaves to make money. I hope I don't have to point out how incoherent this is. After being in charge of Marine for almost half a season, Tyrion finally does something. Hooray! However, he's a moron because he sets up this transitional period which is both fine and dandy. Oh. But he holds the slave cities to this condition under threat of nothing at all. And he asks them to pretty please stop supporting the naughty boys. I get that they want to portray the outsider perspective Tyrion holds as being insufficient, but at the same time, 
time, Tyrion is supposed to be a shrewd diplomatic giga genius. So basically, the slave cities have returned to their ways. Good to see Razdal again, by the way. This guy's fun. And they're funding the baddies. And Tyrion's tactic for de escalating the conflict is asking them nicely. And he's not even that nice about it. I guess he does bribe them with titties, though. You will not receive a better offer. You have offered them nothing! Inside a big dome building, some guys talk about some stuff. After they decide to excuse a brutal murder that happened earlier in the future, they bring in this chick who, oh, that's Daenerys. This guy says, <laughs> which means, and I checked multiple sources on this, I'd like to know what a Khaleesi tastes like, which is fucking insane. Firstly, that's against the law, and you're gonna have to go to jail. Because as was discussed this season, <laughs> It is forbidden to lie with a Khal's widow. Secondly, you are a Khal. You fuckwit. If you want to know what a Khaleesi tastes like, fucking maybe ask your wife, you know, the wife of you, a Khal. What would that be? Anyone know? Vote now on your phones. And lastly, just shut the fuck up. Why are all of these Dothraki the exact same character? All of them, except for maybe Moro, are indistinguishable from one another. If I were one to make low blows, I might ask if that tells you a little bit of how the writer's room considers foreign cultures. And I am one to make low blows. Nah, I'm not calling them racist. Just lazy. Well, at least Moro stands out, suddenly dropping the sex-obsessed frat bro act when he finds out about Danny's circumstances. <laughs> Oh, never mind then. You might think I'm being unfair, but consider a similar character who received probably less attention than Moro did back in season one, Kotho. Kotho had more going on than just I ride horses and I fuck bitches. He was distinguished in his ambition and argumentative nature. He was deeply anti-magic, even more than Davos, and he died for his convictions. It's not a lot, but it's so much more than Moro and these other fuckers. Daenerys concludes that because Drogo promised to do a bunch of wild shit he ended up never doing, and that these guys are doing what the Dothraki always do, that they are unfit to lead the Dothraki, and that she will do all that wild shit Drogo said he would do. Moro isn't hot on that, but then he sees to it that he does become hot on it. The fire spreads incredibly quickly, and these guys just huddle together instead of rushing out, and you know, it, it doesn't look all too flash. Oh no, they can't get out, because the two guys they left to guard the sacred looking building with every khal in it got murdered, and there's a piece of bolsa barring the door. Oh, darn. Mario and Jorah here, weird. Danny throws more fire at Moro and it just rushes towards him because I, I guess she can just tell it where to go. Fire doesn't work like that. It's fucking fire. It goes upstairs. So the whole fucking city shows up to watch what you'd reckon is an extremely important building filled with extremely important people burned down. Like good extras, they do so silently and in complete stillness. That's how I'd react if my culture's most revered building burnt down. Thankfully, the Harold Holt Memorial Swimming Center stands strong to this day. So... Daenerys emerges from a flaming inferno. This is miraculous, and that's okay, this is fantasy, miraculous things can happen. Danny previously survived Drogo's pyre, and she held a really hot thing once, and she likes a hot bath, so I can't claim that this has come out of nowhere. After all, Targaryens are fireproof, right? Targaryens are not immune to fire. The birth of Danny's dragons was unique, magical, wondrous, a miracle. She is called the Unburnt because she walked into the flames and lived, but her brother sure as hell wasn't immune to that molten gold. So she won't be able to do it again? Probably not. Oh, that's weird. Almost as though Targaryens are generally less sensitive to heat than others, but not immune to fire. Almost as though there was an entire civil war where a bunch of Targaryens were burnt to death by dragons. Almost as though Danny's survival at the Pyre was a once-off miracle. But wouldn't you expect to see other mystical shit going on at the Pyre then? Oh. I'm not entirely certain what the mechanics here are. What exactly has activated her fireproofness, like it didn't work for Viserys, so would Danny have survived the Golden Crown? Is it just like fire can't burn her skin? Don't people tend to asphyxiate in fires? So does Daenerys, unlike the overwhelming majority of known life forms, not require oxygen to survive? But you can't criticize it because Daenerys is our queen! Yes, I know. I like Daenerys most of the time, but this is fucking mental. I guess it is foretelling of Danny's tendency to solve problems by exploding them. Hey, maybe she would have actually gotten on with Cersei. But it's cheap of the show to keep portraying this as a good thing and then suddenly at the last minute pull the rug out and tell us it was a bad thing all along. You know? Cake had 
cake eaten. And like, this was her plan, man. Hey, Danny, what if they don't have a brazier burning in the room? Hey, Danny, what if it turns out you can't control where fire goes? Hey, Danny, what if Dario and Jorah can't discreetly kill the two guys they left to guard the building? Hey, Danny, what if these fuck asses left more than two idiots guarding them? Hey, Danny, what if it turns out the Dothraki don't like that you murdered their leaders and destroyed their big dome building? Hey, Danny, hey, go on, girl. I feel like we never talk anymore. And that's where the episode ends, but the video tragically must go on. Back to Marine we go. Why does this band of Miranese freemen speak perfect common. We can read subtitles, HBO, it's okay. Unless for whatever reason you're trying to attract an audience that can't read. Tyrion unblinkingly lies to concerned citizens. When does she return? Soon. You have my word. And he speaks on behalf of others for no reason. As commander of the Unsullied, he knows how to defeat the slavers. And he knows when it is time to make peace. I hate this guy. He's unbearable. I don't know how anyone can like what they've done with him. And now we've got Missandei quoting Littlefinger. This is all over the place. In the next scene, Tyrion says that they'll use the slaver's contempt as an advantage. Their contempt is their weakness. They'll underestimate us every time and we will use that to our advantage. And like, what? His plan is to literally hope they go along with his proposal. I do hope you accept, my friends having offered them nothing. So you have fan favorite character Tyrion in an important location for a season, in a similar role to his awesome time in season two. They use this opportunity to show how he's incompetent at navigating this foreign culture, but the lasting consequence of his failures is that Danny names him her hand at the end. However, will he recover from this? We've tried nothing and we're all out of ideas. Ooh, Loris doesn't look great. Basically the gist is that the big bird wants Marjorie to break Loris's is his spirit, but his spirit already looks pretty broken. Ah, my spirit! Like, I can't stay strong. I never was strong. I guess that seeing him like this leads her to playing along with the sparrow, so maybe she's got a small brain, and the point was actually to extort her loyalty by breaking her spirit, showing her what they've done to Loris. So that's cool, and I like this scene, it's fine. I would have liked to see Loris lament specific actions of his, maybe restate or recant his love for Renly, I don't know, he's not much of a character at this point. Anyway, Dave and Mel talk about the zombie. She should be starting a religion over this, but she's just hanging out, and he should... I don't know, be apologizing for the time he tried to kill her over values he apparently no longer holds. She tries to leave when he asks her about Stannis, which is exactly what Benioff and Weiss do if you ask them about Stannis. Senile Dave asks a question. What happened down there? Melisandre answers. There was a battle. Stannis was defeated. Then Davos asks a follow-up question. What happened to the princess? Which Mel clearly doesn't want to answer, but luckily, Brienne, who is here now, steps in to answer the first question, which she probably wouldn't have been able to hear and had already been answered. I saw what happened. I saw Stannis' forces defeated in the field. Like, no, Brian, the question was very obviously about Shireen. What happened to the princess? It's just such a random interjection. Season 6's Brienne is such a shitter. She then admits to unlawfully murdering a man, something for which she is never held accountable. Epic. Davos looks annoyed at Brienne, but never again brings up that she killed the man he owed everything to. Melisandre successfully slinks away so that she doesn't have to answer Dave's question. Because of course, there's no way he could just ask her again later. It's not like they're in the same location all the time. Danny chats with the Dosh Khalin in that building she burnt down earlier, and they're really mean to her, even though they bowed down to her. That's strange. They introduce this Lazarine Khaleesi for Danny to bounce off of? Give her a girlfriend she can go to the bathroom with? I, I just. This scene has some discussion of the power women hold in Dothraki society, which is interesting and kind of gives some grounding for Danny doing the thing she does later on earlier. Jario and Dora, who were somehow in the exact bushes Danny chose to go pee in, accost her and her new best friend at knife point. She decides on the spot that they're not going to escape Vaes Dothrak, they're going to change Vaes Dothrak. I guess spurred on by the discussion about women and power. Okay, that's not bad, except for her plan being insane. She also says, We will never get out face Dothrak alive. Even though the dude snuck in fine and the Dothraki don't seem that interested in guarding anything. This lady instantly agrees to help Danny overthrow the culture that kidnapped her, go figure, brilliantly setting up her 
doing anything later at all. Yeah, this seems kind of weird and random. Given how batshit the plan is, I feel like if maybe you'd given the script a second draft, you'd have found a way to make a more believable plan that somehow involves this lady who just said she wouldn't betray your characters. Like, am I nuts for taking issue with this? What's the point? I know that dropping plots is just about in vogue for Game of Thrones at this point, but dropping a plot you set up in the same episode? That's an any percent world record, surely. Everyone shut up! Drop everything! Sweet Robin is on screen! The King of Calcium himself is demonstrating his magnificent prowess when big boy Petey shows up. What a happy little family! It gives the guy a falcon for his birthday. I love birds, this is a good scene already. Pattaya extorts Royce, which is good fun. Should we throw him through the moon door? Some things never change. Honestly, not entirely sure why Peter keeps Royce alive. He's not all that useful. Especially when you remember Peter saying shit like, Money buys a man silence for a time. A bolt in the heart buys it forever. It kind of seems like a massive liability, but whatever. Peter's not being a total moron in this scene, which after reviewing season 7 is all I could ever ask for. He then explains Sansa's situation to Robin, but he starts the story at like the beginning of season 6. My friends in the north tell me Sansa has escaped Winterfell. Uh, if the last you heard about Sansa was when she left the Vale at the start of season 5, wouldn't you be hella confused by this? Anyway, whatever, the scene ends with the biggest of deals, the Knights of the Vale finally entering the fight, the most esteemed army on the continent, untouched by the wars that have ravaged the rest of the kingdoms for like five years now. Can't wait to see the one thing they do. Can't wait to see how other people react to this, like Cersei or Elena. You know, it seems like the writers kind of forgot that Littlefinger exists outside of whatever plot Sansa is relevant to. I went on about that enough in season 7. Must move on. In Vase Dothrak, Dario makes a funny before Jorah tries to bluff some dudes who can tell they're not merchants somehow. Vase Dothrak isn't off limits to foreigners or anything like that, so I don't know why they're snooping around in the first place. They could just be walking through the streets like anybody else. A fight happens, it is so very dark. Dario kills them both and of course never faces repercussions for his breaking of the same sacred law that has been established since season 1. He makes a quip about his dagger that I have to pretend to not understand because of the dumb structure of this video. He covers up his stabbingses with a big rock. NEXT! Pycelle is doing nothing to help Tommen and Cersei tells him to fuck off. He does so at a comical pace. He smiles at Cersei on his way out, which is just like, what? This guy is so fucking weird. Even though they cut that fishing scene from season 3, it's still canon that he's putting on an act, but uh, remind me again why he was doing that. All I did. I get for House Lannister. He's a Lannister simp, right? So why isn't he doing everything he can to consolidate their power and keep the family together? In the small council meeting last episode, he's completely on side with this Kevin Olenna faction when he should be attempting to bridge the gap. I get that for personal reasons and for competence reasons he would prefer that Kevin called the shots, but the sustained humiliation and declawing of Cersei Lannister should be a big problem in Pycelle's eyes and yet he does nothing. Tomo says that all this High Sparrow stuff is dangerous for Marge and Cersei's like, where the fuck was this gumption in season 5? And I'm like, remember when there was more than one thing happening in King's Landing? I'm just so sick of hearing about this one guy, you know? There's so much else to be talking about. I get that you want to focus on this religious up rising plots so that you can develop the characters and themes. But look man, Ilaria has done a coup in Dawn, which was King's Landing's ally. You'd think someone might be keeping tabs on that. And dude, Roos Bolton is dead, Sansa Stark is publicly alive, and Littlefinger's gone rogue, but neither Cersei nor anyone else shows interest in securing the North. Also, you'd reckon that news of Tyrion's rise to power in Marine would have made it to King's Landing by now, but no! We have to slowly retread Philosophy 101. We have to fart and walk away. We have to talk about shoes. Whoa, look, a sensible segue. Marge gets dragged into the best room and tells proselytizing Pete over here that she'd go to her family if he let her out. Sparry says that that's money and power and finery, which is sin, and sin isn't cool, even though, you know, wouldn't anyone seek their family in? It's not her fault that they're rich and powerful and cool and they ride horses all the time. Then he tells this story about how he made shoes and got money and partied and shit, like, yeah bro, go get him, live in that Sigma grind set, but then he realized that his rock and roll shoemaker lifestyle was all hogwash and all his friends were poses. Marge points out that his story resembles something in a book we know fuck all about. Look at the stranger, verse 25. But his story isn't exactly like the block of the Strangler, I guess, so that was fun, thanks for writing that dialogue in. He apparently just abandoned his king shit ways to seek the noble poor. It's so well acted, but I'm not sure I understand the 
point of it. If it's to convince Marjorie to play along, I fail to see how that works because she does that based on her interaction with Loris, which he could have forced at any time without ever rambling about shoes. If it's not for that reason, then I fail to see why he tells the story at all. If you think you can help me out with that, please leave a comment at idontreadyourcomments.co.uk slash this plot is boring and you can't change my mind.html. Now seriously, I'm still unsure if he's for real or just fucking with her, but in the end it doesn't even matter because, well, they all explode. You know, just like in philosophy. Plato's cave ends with a big explosion. At the end of a long and perilous jetpack ride, Theon reaches Pike in a manner that can only be described as fucking somehow. Upon entering the room where all the scenes at Pike happen, they do this thing where it looks like the first shot of Balon in season two. Like, look at that, isn't that neat? Isn't that a worse colour palette? She's really pissy at him for that awful scene in season four, but really it's not Theon's fault that a shirtless Ramsay Snow somehow defeated a boat full of men while charging shoulder first into swords. No, we're not doing a season four piss take. Have you seen season four? She asks him why he came back here and he says, Where else could I go? Which is... Look, you can't just do that. It's such a cowardly cop-out. It's fucking sneaky what they've done here. In one line, the writers hand wave Theon inexplicably finding passage from the north to Pike and excuse the mad decision of his to come here in the first place. Where else could you have gone? I don't know, man. Maybe Castle Black, the place the people you were traveling with were going. Maybe atone for your sins, conclude some drama with the Starks and get sucked up into this story a bit later on. Yara is a strong enough character. She can deal with this shit on her own, maybe craft a bit more of an identity for herself, wouldn't that be cool? But I guess they don't trust the audience enough to give a shit about Yara on her own, even though they made us sit through Dawn in season 5. So they jam Theon into this plot in spite of the perfectly carved place for him at Castle Black. I hope this doesn't sound like I'm just angry that what I wanted to happen didn't happen, because that's not at all what it is. I'm angry that all these things that are happening just don't really add up and it's quite easy to see, and these guys were paid a shit ton for the precise job of making a good story. And I guess my idea of a good story just puts more weight on characters and plots being, you know, coherent than theirs does. Like, your one job is to make this good, and Theon's flight to Pike simply isn't for multiple, extremely obvious reasons. It's a really important point, because everything he does for the rest of the show from here is kinda a consequence of this. So why not, I dunno, provide a reason behind any of this? Ever? Ugh. Like, Yara's pretty quick to accuse him of coming back to claim Balon's crown, but yeah, he didn't know about that, so it's not that, but why then? What are you doing here, Theon? And then he says that Yara should be queen, probably just because she's his sister, and that's the whole scene. Dario and Jorah have made it to Veus Dothrak, and I'm really starting to wonder what the point of presenting this non-linearly is. This Dutch guy, whose name I refuse to pronounce correctly, calls Jorah old and taunts him about Daenerys. Jorah is angry and wants to stab him a little, but not while they're on the clock. And I like that this combative dynamic is instantly contrasted when Dario spots the grayscale. Like his demeanor instantly changes as he realizes what Jorah is dealing with. And him holding onto his knife is good too. Dario doesn't care much for culture and tradition and he does care much for solving problems with violence. Given all this and that I'm just generally a fan of these bros hanging out together, I quite like this scene. Yeah, Glimbert, you're always so negative. Shut up, no I'm not. As if to instantly discredit what I just said, the goddamn pink letter arrives during an awkward luncheon, which Davos isn't present for because the writers don't know how to deal with him and Brienne in the same room. In A Dance with Dragons, the pink letter is sort of, kinda, the climax of Jon's story. Everything about it riles Jon up, regardless of who actually sent it. Arriving after a book-long series of shaky decisions of increasing importance, the letter pushes Jon over his limit and he declares his intention to fight for Winterfell, which in turn seems to push certain conspirators over their limit and they murder Jon. But in the show, so John's already done his death arc, and he already has his sister safely in his custody. Divorced of this context, the letter is not only a flaccid facsimile, it's also just kinda a weird element in the story. It forces John to perform a character backflip, ending any potential development on his part, and it forces the Winterfell plot to boringly contort to accommodate for Rickon's role in the letter. That's the only reason he's back in the story, by the way, to get John off his grumpy little bottom and start fighting again. Wouldn't it have been so much more natural? natural for him to show up towards the end of season 5, so Sansa is racked with guilt that she can't save him when she escapes, and she can show up to Castle Black with a reason for Jon to fight instead of it arriving from a postman? I dunno, that's your Glingus spitballs a rewrite moment of the day. For some reason the letter arrives with none of Rickon's skin attached, or 
like, why didn't Ramsay send Shaggy Dog's head with it to prove that he has Rickon? Because as it is, John's like, well, we don't know he has Rickon, which is super fair. And Sansa says, yeah, we do. He definitely does. Yep, he's telling the truth. And that's so weird, man. He could just be lying. It'd be so easy for him to do. Lying is so easy, guys. She also just assumes that he killed Roose. And yes, she's right about those things, but she just says them with no evidence and nobody questions her because there's no time for any of this. You know, a changed John, one who had been affected by his own death, might not care too much about Rickon and still not want to fight for Winterfell. I'm tired of fighting. Or maybe he would be thirsty for revenge and recklessly attack Ramsay without taking the time to rally forces. Or I guess just keep being your regular old self, John. It's not like anything spectacular has happened to you recently. The phrase come and see is repeated in the letter as it is in the books, and knowing how thoroughly people analyse the letter's contents to determine its author, I think it's kind of funny that earlier in the episode, Peter Baelish says, My lord, come and see. So there you go, Fimbles wrote the letter. Sorry about the food. It's not what we're known for. You be nice to Three Finger Hob, he's the most dedicated member of the Night's Watch. Cersei tells Kevdog, and uh, Olena's not really a name I can fuck with. Hmm. Cersei tells Catdog and the Queen of Yawns that Marge is gonna have a church-sanctioned nudist parade, which is a thing she learned in the Tommen scene, but I was too busy rambling over it to mention. This pushes them both to work with the King's parents, changing their behaviour from the snotty little children they were last episode. For Elena, this is okay, although I don't see why she wouldn't expect the Walk of Atonement for Marjorie to begin with, but Kevin is won over by talk of getting Lancel back. Do you want Lancel back? Or have you given him up for good? Of course I want him back. And nothing has changed in regards to that. He just suddenly cares about that now. You see, in the last council meeting, the writers didn't want anything to actually happen so they could maintain the status quo for this meeting where Cersei is informed about Marjorie's walk. So instead, they had a fart happen in that meeting. Even though Kevin being vocally concerned about Lancel in the last meeting would have been so much better, creating some tension between him and his informal ally in Olena, and also making for a wonderful callback to They yeah. hurt my son! Anyway, the plan is to bring the Tyrell army to King's Landing, but Kevin says The king has ordered me to take no action against the High Sparrow or the Faith Militant. Even though Jamie was clearly talking to Olena, but at least it's in service of something actually happening two episodes from now. Jon Snow is still at Castle Black, even though the last episode made it look like he was leaving. Hey, wouldn't it have been fun if Sansa arrived just after Jon left? Or if she showed up just as he was leaving? Anyway, he expresses that he wants to go south, just to hang out, having given up on what he believed in, which is a great change so long as it lasts for more than half a scene, oh well. Ed is angry, and they ever so briefly debate the Night's Watch Oath before the horn blows. Now, I don't mind that the first Starks to reunite are the ones who had the least of a connection. Jon is still home for Sansa, still Winterfell, regardless of how little they actually got on. I do hate that they use it to nullify any interesting development for Jon, and that they removed Theon from the crew. Like, how big would it have been if after Jon embraced Sansa, he saw Theon and had to deal with that too? Sansa says she's thought a lot about how she was an ass, but you know, it would have been nice if we'd known that prior to this scene. Even the smallest amount of build-up would have gone a long way. Sansa had three episodes on the way to Castle Black, outside of Ramsay's grasp, where she could have expressed anything about her relationship with John, but no, they used that time to do, um, well, they escape Ramsay's disappearing hounds, Theon leaves for some reason, and, uh, uh, that's it. This is excellent, because I didn't want to get anything out of this scene anyway. Uh, I shouldn't be too mean. I think Kit does a good job here, and the plot isn't too silly. Except Sansa expresses a desire to conquer Winterfell, which confuses me because they already sorted that out in the pink letter scene. Weird. Ah, oh, shit, I almost forgot to mention Tormund leering at Brienne. It, yeah, it's funny, but that doesn't mean you have to forget everything else about the character. Unfortunately, after Hardhome, the only material they ever give to Tormund is bawdy sex stuff. I'm hard-pressed to even call them jokes because what kind of god would have a peck of that small and ah dick I like it. A little more than levity breaks in tense situations, surely not enough to replace an entire character. So yeah, give him a crush on Brienne, that's a funny idea and it works, but like, can he still be Tormund? And if you fall, don't scream. You don't want that to be the last thing she remembers. Easy thing to say to a man in chains. We miss you, man. Hey, Ramsey.
How do you like them apples? This character we brought back for no reason last episode? Quick, kill her! Kill her now! And never mention her again! Now, this is the most tense scene in the whole show because, you know, she could actually do it! Osha, who has been gone since season 3, hasn't spoken a line in years, has no clear purpose in the show going forward. Yeah, she might actually kill the main antagonist. <laughs> Uh, this is a nothing scene. We learn nothing about anything, gain no insight on anyone's character except for kind of Osha, a tertiary character everyone had forgotten about, being a naive moron who thought this would actually work, and no plots go in any direction. Remove this scene. That's the sentence. I'm not elaborating. I'm breaking form, bitches. The medium is the message, you fucks. Yeah, this scene? Get rid of it. That other scene? Take Osha out of it. Done. I don't hate Osha. Just get rid of her. Write a line for Rickon about how the umbers killed her, except you can't because his voice is broken. Ah shit, I fucking elaborated, god damn it. I just can't help myself, it's not an addiction. I can stop elaborating whenever I want. I just don't want to stop, it makes me feel good. But what would you put instead of it, glim pimp pimp pimp? I don't know, maybe something that makes Rickon an actual character? Or how about the two new dudes introduced at Winterfell, Ramsay's mini bosses? You know, maybe give them something to do, because really all they do is show up, hang around, and then die later on. Nobody gives anything resembling a shit about Small John Umber, and Harold Karstark is so forgettable that I called him the wrong name in episode 2. Ramsay is so fun to watch, and Winterfell is a place that the audience cares about, and yet they do nothing with them throughout the majority of the season. What are you doing? Go on, do something! In conclusion, Bloke of the Stugler doesn't have any scenes with Arya or Bran, so it's a 10 out of 10 for me. Thanks for watching, I stream sometimes, uh, I tweet sometimes, and I'm always on Discord. It's a problem. Here's a list of people who send me money. Agla here, Lord Org, Avery Lane, Dylan, M, Hail the Orange, Ingvold, Hoveram, Jamez, Joshi Bear, Mormoths, Nurse Ratchet, Richard, Samson, Shrimper Jr., Simcoe, Stay78, STL Guna, Waffle, Yen, and Ondi. I didn't write a quip for the end of this one.